Welcome everyone to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and after the Battle of Missionary Ridge, Ulysses S. Grant will be moving to the Eastern Theater, leaving Thomas and Sherman in the West. With Grant gone, Thomas settled in as Army Commander. Thomas would adopt and expand military matters as Commander of the Army of the Cumberland. For one, he made several improvements to the Army of the Cumberland's map-making department. He supervised the development of a specially equipped wagon for the topographical engineers, which traveled with Thomas's headquarters. The wagon had sides that folded down into desks and awnings that folded out to keep maps and papers dry. Under Thomas, the Army of the Cumberland's map making department became the most sophisticated such organization in the war, superior to any other topographical department in either the Union or the Confederacy. He worked closely with the Sanitary Commission to improve the environment for his troops. He gave the New York chapter of that organization an autograph to be auctioned off with the proceeds benefiting the commission. His actions as army commander highlights his caring nature for his soldiers, who did what he asked them to do. That care did not stop when the soldier died, either. Thomas helped to establish a national cemetery in Chattanooga for the soldiers who perished in the fights for the city. He chose the site for the cemetery and gave Thomas Van Horn, the chaplain of the army, the responsibility of getting it established. Van Horn suggested burying the dead in lots according to their state, but Thomas said, No, no, mix them up, mix them up. I am tired of states' rights. However, the dead from the African American regiments will be segregated from the whites. The army faced a large problem in the winter of 1863 into 64. Enlistments were coming up. Many soldiers had signed three-year enlistments, and they would be leaving the army soon to head home. The War Department offered rewards for regiments who retained three-quarters of their enlistments, if reenlistments fell below that percentage, the unit would be broken up and the soldiers assigned to different regiments. A humorous story emerged around this time when an East Tennessee private called out to Thomas. Hey mister, you, I want to speak with you. Thomas ignored the breach in military etiquette and rode over to the private. The young man asked for a furlough to see his wife. Thomas asked how long it had been since he had seen his wife. The private said, ever since I enlisted, nearly three months. Thomas laughed and said three months. Why, my good man, I haven't seen my wife for three years. The private stared for a moment and said, Well, you see, me and my wife ain't that kind. Thomas also appointed Jonathan Clem to be an orderly for him and his staff. Clem had run away from home at 11 years old in 1862 and joined the 22nd Michigan Infantry as a drummer boy. At Chickamauga, he had shot a Confederate officer when the rebels tried to apprehend him on Snodgrass Hill, and he forever became known as the drummer boy of Chickamauga. In August 1864, Thomas mustered Clem out of service and sent him to a private boarding school in Indiana. As commander of the army and the Department of the Cumberland, Thomas had to work closely with politicians in Tennessee, namely the military governor of that state, Andrew Johnson. A board of claims was set up to review the claims of citizens whose property was appropriated by the Union Army so they could be paid for what had been taken from them. Thomas instituted much more strict rules and cracked down on secessionists who dared to claim loyalty after coming under Union occupation. As a Southerner who had suffered greatly for his decision to remain loyal to the Union, Thomas evidently felt especially resentful of former secessionists who now professed loyalty. In late 1863, when Confederate partisans at Mulberry, Tennessee killed three of their five prisoners, the other two escaping to Union lines, Thomas levied a $30,000 fine on all of the citizens living within 10 miles of that atrocity, as a punishment and hopefully as a deterrent for helping aid guerrillas. Although federal politicians had tried to legislate how runaway slaves would be handled and treated in Union lines, Army commanders did not see clearly defined lines. For example, Rosecrans had issued orders telling his subordinates to accept able-bodied men into federal lines as they would be useful as laborers but not allow women, children, or men incapable of labor. Many of Rosecrans' subordinates disobeyed these orders out of compassion for the slaves, and Rosecrans did not force the issue. However, Thomas was much stricter. He ordered his men to enforce the policy of excluding women, children, and unemployable men from Union lines. He also revoked an order made by a subordinate commander in Gallatin, Tennessee, that required the white trustees of plantations in that area under his command to pay their slaves wages and supply them with clothing. Thomas considered master-slave relations to be a matter of civil law, and he scolded the Gallatin commander for overstepping his authority. 
When Lorenzo Thomas, the army's adjutant general, heard about Thomas's exclusion of women, children, and some men from entering his lines, he countermanded the order and had Thomas set up a contraband camp, and he also overrode Thomas's decision with the officer in Gallatin and stated that the soldier could require slave owners to pay their slaves a wage. Thomas considered escaped slaves to be a potential threat to white society and took steps to make sure they stayed under white control. All African-American males who did not possess passes were sent to the recruiting office for enlistment or into labor camps. In other matters involving runaway slaves, Thomas was kind. Early in his command of the Army of the Cumberland, a situation arose when the slaves who were working on a fort were not being paid because the Army could not distinguish between loyal and secessionist owners. If their owner was a Confederate sympathizer, then the slaves would be paid directly for their labor. If the owner was loyal to the Union, the owner would be paid for the labor. Since the army could not distinguish the owner's loyalty, none of the slaves were being paid. Thomas stepped in and through War Department approval, got all the slaves paid for their labor. Thomas also hired a runaway slave as a personal servant. When the cavalry was planning an expedition into the area where the runaway slave had been enslaved, Thomas issued orders to the cavalry commander to free the servant's wife and children and bring them back to camp. This all goes to show that Thomas's view of African Americans was nuanced, but it can be safely stated that although he could be generous and kind in his treatment, he still did not trust them and felt it necessary to keep them under close supervision. Thomas also supported the recruitment of African American males for the United States Army as a necessary war measure, but he did not trust them to perform well in combat. When black soldiers were sick or wounded, they were taken to a refugee camp hospital with a higher mortality rate than the white soldier hospital. Enough complaints from subordinates who were involved in the African American recruitment forced Thomas to establish a hospital just for black soldiers. When a commander of a black regiment complained that his regiment had yet to see active duty, Thomas stated, When you shall have learned cheerfully to perform your duty to the best of your abilities in such a position as may be assigned you, then shall you have learned the final lessons of the discipline which apparently you are so anxious should be taught your regiment. One of Thomas's biographers stated, while Thomas's racial opinions were conservative by today's standards, by 1863 he was already demonstrating more flexibility on racial issues than most other Southern Unionists and more tolerance than many Northern whites. Many Southern white Unionists feared that putting arms in the hands of blacks would lead to a race war and other atrocities against white civilians. They also felt that allowing African Americans to become soldiers insulted the honor of white soldiers by placing blacks on the same social level. During the winter of 1863 and into 64, a contingent of politicians and military leaders sought to place Thomas at the head of the Army of the Potomac, replacing George Meade in that role. Thomas replied to James Garfield, one of his supporters, by saying, You have disturbed me greatly with the intimation that the command of the Army of the Potomac may be offered to me. It is a position to which I am not the least adapted, and putting my own reputation entirely aside, I sincerely hope that I at least may not be victimized by being placed in a position where I would be utterly powerless to do or contribute in the least toward the suppression of the rebellion. The pressure always brought to bear against the commander of the Army of the Potomac would destroy me in a week without having advanced the cause in the least. Much against my wishes, I was placed in command of this army. I have told you my reasons. Now, however, I believe my efforts will be appreciated by the troops, and I have reasonable hopes that we may continue to do good service. In February 1864, Grant ordered Thomas to perform a reconnaissance in force against the Confederates in northern Georgia. This would accomplish two things. One, it would simply allow Thomas to know where the enemy was and roughly how many troops were there. Two, it would prevent Johnston from sending reinforcements to Mississippi, where Sherman was leading an expedition. Thomas moved out and probed the Confederate entrenchments in northern Georgia, but pulled back before taking any heavy casualties. Thomas reported to Grant that he lacked the supplies to launch a campaign, and many of his men were still on furlough. This only convinced Grant that Thomas was slow and unaggressive. This campaign also allowed Thomas to formulate a plan for an upcoming campaign. Some of his scouts found a gap called Snake Creek Gap that if utilized by Thomas's army could sever the railroad to the south of the Confederate army. Sherman would take command of the Union forces in the west, placing Thomas under Sherman's authority. Those two had been friends for a long time, but the upcoming campaign would test their friendship. 
Thomas's great engineer corps in the Army of the Cumberland greatly improved Sherman's chances of success during the next campaign, and Thomas became Sherman's senior advisor. Together, they would work to capture Atlanta.